welcome everyone. I'm going to just briefly introduce our panelists, and then uh, we'll get right into the panel. Uh, to my immediate left, we have uh, Alex Lavoie, who's the U.S. General Manager for VIA. He joined the company in 2014, shortly after it was founded. He told me there were seven employees when he joined. He's launched a service here in New York City. Prior to VIA, Alex worked as an investor in the technology group at private equity firm TPG Capital. Uh, next to uh, Alex is Rob Wisniewski. He's the uh, CTO at Clear. Rob's obsession with uh, scalable cloud-like deployments was incubated working on IBM's WebSphere platform and extreme scale distributed distri grid, data grid. It's quite a mouthful. <laughs> and uh, next to Rob, we have Nikki Galumis. She's a co-founder and COO of Nova Credit, cross-border credit bureau. Nova Credit was started at Stanford, where Nikki and her co-founders like to say, and I quote, Nova is a sort of class project gone wrong. As a professor, I like that a lot. <laughs> uh, before Stanford, Nick D worked at Bain and in agricultural development in East Africa. So let's get started. Um, if we just start with a very brief description of, of the pain point, the problem that your companies, your businesses are solving for consumers. We'll just kick it off that way. Get us started. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Um, so at VIA, we are ultimately um, building dynamic mass transit systems. and so. Um, to maybe uh, put that to a specific pain point, um, in the United States, 25% of uh, low and middle wage jobs um, are, m are uh, under 90 minutes um, uh, commute by mass transit uh, to get to the job. So 75% of people are, are outside of a 90 minute commute um, to, to get to their jobs. Um, and that's a huge sort of transportation uh, and economic mobility problem. Um, and we're building mass transit solutions um, and now have deployed them in over, over 45 markets around the world, um, ultimately to try to sol solve that and other urban uh, transportation problems. Thanks, Alex. Rob? Yeah, yeah. so uh, Clear is a uh, consumer identity and biometrics company. Um, what we're really doing is we're uh, doing a proofing of strong identity, the version of you that can get on a plane, which is our primary and biggest use case and what everybody knows us for, uh, but the version of you that can rent a car or check into a, a doctor's office or um, you know, buy alcohol. Um, so that version of you proofed one time and then connected via biometrics to be used at sort of a digital scale with, effic with efficiency, so amortize that one proofing. Also keeping the privacy, you shouldn't be needing to present all of the information that's in your passport or on your driver's license to a random person letting you into a bar or letting you off a lot. Um, so ideally we're connecting strong identity to digital scale um, and bringing a world where the members are our customers and they're sort of controlling their own identity, so. Nikki, over here. Um, so Nova Credit is a cross-border credit bureau, uh, which in English uh, means, I guess we probably have a, a number of international students here in the crowd, maybe wave. So I was also an international student. I moved to the US. Um, when I moved to the US, I applied for a credit card. I got rejected. I tried to get a mobile phone, and I got shifted over to a prepaid plan. And when I tried to rent an apartment, I was asked for a six-month deposit up front. Uh, because I had no credit history here in the US and therefore no financial identity. And so we solve that by providing lenders, property managers, and others with credit reports from around the world so that they can underwrite and serve immigrant applicants that they'd otherwise reject. Sure. Thanks for the introduction. I think you're probably very familiar with, with several of these businesses. So the, the question we want to dig into to begin with, since this is sort of the business, the intersection of society, is you're all private companies, private businesses, providing services to a certain extent either replace what the government's already doing or supplement what the government is doing. So why is a private company better? Why, why should private companies be moving into this space? And whoever would like to kick that off? Let's go first with that. Well, I think, go for it. yeah, uh, happy, <laughs> happy to. Uh, listen, I, we're, we're operating in an aviation security checkpoint. Um, the, the, the inspiration for that was actually the government asking for help in that through a program called Registered Traveler. That was a pretty much a step-by-step -step program as to how they could privatize and distribute uh, some of this responsibility in response to the, um, in, this is in 2003. So you can imagine why that was all a big uh, topic then. Um, but as I look at it, you know, when we start to uh, when we start to offer uh, a private or commercial aspect, we're really a hospitality company in a place where they have no reason to be hospitable. We're, hosp we're, we're hospitable because it's part of our business. So you can imagine not only the innovation scaling. If we invent something 
the government shouldn't have to buy it from us if we're willing to provide that service in exchange for a commercial relationship with the people using it. So we're sort of cutting out some uh, of the complication of giving access in those historically public uh, use cases to access the innovation, the motivation, and the sort of flow of, of a commercial relationship. Um, it's about scale, right? Uh, why run through procurement and run through government contracting when we can find uh, areas for partnership where it makes sense? So that, that's kind of where Clear uh, plays in that space. I'd say for us that's a little bit different. So um, we operate in the credit reporting world, and there's, there's a big debate in the credit reporting world around like whether or not that should be offered by the government or the private sector. Mm -hmm. um, some countries have private credit bureaus, other ones have publics. The sort of arguments pro and con is, you know, should governments be able to access that type of consumer data directly, um, which is sort of at one extreme, the, the China example right now with, with some of the credit reporting that's going on there. Um, conversely, like our private enterprises, like better situated from a technology standpoint and so forth to be updating and maintaining modern infrastructure. And I think you know, some of the recent developments in the US uh, with breaches and so forth like, lead, lead that into question as well. Um, but for us, it's, it's, it's really independent of that debate because what we're doing is we're facilitating multiple databases around the world, whether they're private or public, working with one another. So because of this cross-border piece, there's, there's really no single government that could do this. There are actually some attempts to do something similar to what we do in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s of, of building a cross-border credit bureau. But what, what that means is just from a permutation standpoint, you have to have partnerships in every single direction versus we come in and we're the Switzerland of credit bureaus with this neutral third party. We work with everyone. We operate as a single hub. And there's just so much efficiency to it. Switzerland of credit bureaus. So that's mm. got to go, go right to it. <laughs> we have equally good chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, what are your thoughts um, on that? In our case, I think. Uh, it, we obviously operate um, transportation systems and provide transportation technology, and so it's really hard for us to operate fully independently of, of government and the public sector, and so we rely on the public sector um, to provide road space, and that's a, a critical asset for us uh, to move people around. Um, and so, and in a lot of ways, part of our business is actually enabling um, uh, transit agencies and the public sector uh, through technology. So we, we want to be partners uh, to the public sector uh, in a lot of different ways. Um, I will say, though, that often when the public sector or a transit agency looks to us um, to help them with their um, with challenges they're having in their, their transit systems. I think there are a few things um, that we have the freedom to do um, that are a little bit easier. I think one is, to, and to start, and, and probably one of the most challenging things, is the public sector is often um, in the spotlight. And it's, it's not easy for them to um, run experimental pilots um, at small scale, um, because everything they do is under a lot of scrutiny. Um, it's much easier for us to test new products and test things. Um, it's not easy for them um, to procure things quickly. Um, for good reason, they have um, often have very rigid uh, procurement rules. And, and we, um, we certainly can see the reason they have those, but it's easier for us to move a little bit more quickly and try things, um, and sometimes to do that on behalf of a government. Um, and w w there are also things, um, things like the types of uh, uh, workers that governments can, can, uh, can work with. Um, it's a little bit easier for uh, companies like ours to work with contractors, quite a bit harder for um, governments to. So when you're trying to create flexible transit systems, I think it's, um, th that is sometimes an advantage. So there are a number of ways in which I think flexibility and speed um, are a little bit easier for, for um, companies like ours versus the government. Uh, but we, we like to help enable the government as much as we can and be a, a sort of a, a, a critical partner for us. So you, you work together in many ways. And I think it's fair to say that business is very innovative. That's a business survives and, and, and provides uh, innovation society. Um, what is it your businesses do beyond what every other business does for society? I mean, every business creates employment. Every business contributes, uh, well, every business should contribute to the tax base. <laughs> I'm sure they all do. Um, but today, social businesses are, are extremely popular and talked about. I think all, I think all business provides social good. What, is it, what are the social goods that your businesses provide beyond the obvious? And, and, and a related question is, to who? Who benefits from this? And does it matter who? I mean, if anyone benefits, is that, is that good? What are, what are your thoughts on the social, the social side of your enterprise? Same order, yeah, I guess. That <laughs> as, as you wish. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, describe what we do. Um, I think a lot of, we are, I believe, measurably more efficient, for sure, um, uh, more secure, uh, I think, when we look at our ability to authenticate credentials and then uh, verify identity and then the pace at which we can do that over and over again. Um, those are 
then translated directly into efficiency, speed, um, the ability to refocus resources where there might be more unknowns and just raw, uh, more you know, safer experiences. Um, as you look at maybe how we would be a part of uh, healthcare, um, you reduce fraud, uh, you reduce uh, effectively um, the, the allocation of resources where they shouldn't be. So that's efficiency as well as safety, costs come down. Um, when it looks at who it is, you know, we definitely sort of get leveled a, a few times. Like there's a premium service, there's a, a, a separation. And I just kind of approach that head on in the sense that you can actually sign up for Clear for free. And there's many benefits of Clear that have nothing to do with that, specifically the aviation security checkpoint. Um, so we, we would welcome anybody to be a part of it and, and, and get the benefits of, of that strong identity. Um, but as such, even if you're, there's a certain uh, membership of customer relationship, the, the benefits that then flow out through the terminal, through the, even the concessions and the boarding, um, uh, if you're just focused on the airport use case, uh, tend to uh, offer an alternative. And we always, the tip of the spear in technology and efficiency is always some sort of early adoption or some sort of, uh, sort of commercial flow that allows us to be motivated to build the product. So, um, you know, I think the, we have measurable uh, benefit and ideally it just becomes more and more standard and that benefits more people as we grow. Okay, so sort of a broader benefit yeah. on the social front. What do you think, Nikki? You're more focused, I think, on different population. Yeah, I mean, so, so our mission is, is very focused on, on immigrants. Um, our mission as a company is to enable immigrants to realize their potential, which, which goes a lot broader than just the credit use case, and, that, and that's something that we're investing in more and more. You know, moving country, resettling is always um, a tough experience. How can we provide immigrants not just with the products they need, but also like information on how does US healthcare work, or how do you get set up in the DMV? Um, the who question, I, so, so I think you know, we feel pretty proud of, of what we're doing mm -hmm. um, and, and our mission. I, I think the who question is difficult. Um, and I think it is, I, I think you see this a lot in FinTech right now. You see a lot of providers building incredible new products, but they end up like really, um, really addressing a like 1% or a 10%, uh, top 1% or top 10% wealth-wise of the population. Um, and that cherry picking as a system ends up being dangerous. You create more systemic risk by like separating people into groups at times, as well as you know what your ideology might be on like the overall inequality and whether, whether those innovations do end up trickling down. Um, and so for us at Nova, I think you know, there's, it is really easy to start with, you know, and, and that's where I started my story, an immigrant who's like me. You know, I'm, I've had access to great education, schools, and careers, and I came here with a certain level of financial security that not all immigrants come with to the US. And that is an, an obvious like, credit risk mismatch, and it's an obvious market opportunity. But there are many, many more immigrants in the US who aren't all like me and, and don't necessarily have the ease, frankly, that I've had. Um, and, and I think, you know, in Silicon Valley, where, where we started the company, um, there's a lot of talk around like trickling down. I can think of, you know, there's a company that talks about we make, um, they, they sell cookie dough to supermarkets, and the plan is to build shelf-stable food for Africa. Um, and that is laudable. And I think that, you know, as a company grows and as a business succeeds, there become more opportunities. Oh, sorry, um, to do more good. Um, I would say that for us at Nova, we're trying really hard to be building the impact model in from the early days, like recognizing that we are a business and like if we don't grow or like hit certain revenue numbers, we will shut down. <laughs> so there are like very real constraints. Um, but trying to build that in early, like how can we be a thoughtful business today? Um, and so we've done a number of partnerships with nonprofits where we price our product completely different and support them completely differently. We um, volunteer as a company with the IRC and another NGO that, that serves immigrants called Up Upwardly Global. And, and that's something that we, we keep thinking about. Um, I would say I probably have a long answer on this one because you're sensing some of my, like, my, it's a challenge. Like, I don't think it, it's, a, it's a tidy story. And I think any social enterprise that claims that they have a, a tidy story around social impact, it, it's just marketing versus like, really looking deep. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a complex scenario. Um, I think for us, you know, when, when VIA started, actually, uh, the vision was uh, actually to, to form partnerships um, with public transit agencies um, and to provide technology for them. And that vision, it, it turned out when you have a few people at a startup at the beginning, uh, was quite hard to realize. And, and we uh, got turned down uh, a number of times in trying to do that. And so we decided we're, we're going to go and build this sort of direct to consumer service first. Um, and we, we want to go offer that um, in some of the biggest cities in the world and serve uh, initially at least um, some of the, the sort of dense urban cores of those of those cities, um, where probably on average the, the 
um, socioeconomic um, standards were, were relatively high. Um, but I, I think for me that speaks to the fact that, and then I guess since then to, to sort of finish that story, we, we've in the last two years really been able to realize that initial vision much more, which is to um, take that m sort of dynamic transit solution that we built and, um, and that we now offer in a direct-to-consumer service here in, in, in New York and in, in, um, in London and Chicago um, and use the technology that we built for it um, and, and sort of provide it to public transit agencies and, and governments all around the world um, who are serving um, the use cases uh, often of, of folks in their city um, who are in transit deserts and places that have poor economic mobility um, who are trying to solve um, uh, challenging budgeting and cost problems um, to provide um, really public transit and mass transit for those cities. Um, and so I guess for me, that speaks to the fact that, um, like Nikki said, I think it, it's complex. And, and ultimately, um, we have to build a product um, that, that um, works and a solution that works. Um, and in transportation in particular, it's all about bringing costs down. And we mm. spent a lot of time early on focused on how do we bring costs down and provide something that's low cost enough that helps cities save money, but also in our own consumer uh, service helps bring costs down so that it can be available for as many people as possible. Um, and so that that idea of helping to, to sort of power economic mobility through mass transit has always been something that's been on our mind, but it has taken different sort of paths and, a, and sometimes winding road to get to the sort of full realization. Yeah, right. So Nikki, you mentioned that you, you, you work with NGOs and you, you price differentiate. There are times you provide your yeah, services. Don't, don't tell our customers, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one of the powerful things about technology is, is because the cost of providing the incremental consumer is, is very small, almost zero, you can price differentiate dramatically. So, so back to Rob and, and, and Alex, back to you. Is there, an, is there a situation where you might price differentiate for a disadvantaged population? Is there, is there a, a situation where you use your technology clearly with a social purpose in mind in that sense that, that you would different? Or is that really not going to apply to your markets? For us, I think um, we we don't often do that directly in our direct consumer services. But when we partner with um, with governments, they, they will often. I mean, they are often um, sort of price discriminating in a variety of ways. Um, so, for example, um, we have a, a service we run in um, in Los Angeles. It was launched recently. Um, we're working with uh, LA Metro, the public transit agency there, um, to run uh, a number of services, and um, they have discounts for the elderly. They have discounts um, uh, for folks who are in wheelchairs, and so um, we we um, we have to build various mechanisms to account for the, that in our technology. Um, and so, and that's actually true in, in, in most deployments we have when we work with the public sector. So for us, we, we do, but I would say it's enabled through sort of public sector partnership. Through that partnership with the government. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you think? Um, you know, our, uh, there, there's many, I think the form that that would take for clear would be about um, sort of the partnership that we choose. Because like I said, I think the baseline is free. Um, it, everybody can be a part of the clear platform. And then there's certain use cases, which I think themselves aren't pressing to uh, allow, like, you know, allowing a bit faster faster access through an aviation security point and checkpoint isn't, then that's the one thing we charge for, isn't necessarily the thing that we're going to jump out and say, hey, by the way, you know, uh, make sure you get that, that luxury in order to. However, in situations um, where our balance is this, if we were seen to be too uh, sort of uh, overstepping with respect to, hey, the government needs us to uh, allow for more disadvantaged pricing, we, we actually don't we don't share anything with the government. Our, our members are our customers. Our members are proving their identity to us, and then we're sharing that. It's, it's sort of a, a, a contentious but partnership relationship. Um, therefore, it's about the use case. And I think you know our, our current uh, build out is to literally make it a utility um, that is free as a baseline. Um, now, our availability in certain areas will be interesting as we get into slight healthcare. Um, you know, as our, our general population changes and our general uh, consumer type changes from, say, a frequent flyer or a business traveler into somebody who's visiting a clinic or visiting, um, you know, a, a sport. we are already in sports venues, for instance. Um, as long, our, our biggest uh, step is going to make sure we are equally available with respect to the identity proofing technology and making sure we're not differentiating in that regard. Um, so that's most of our focus because I, I can't let, make it cheaper than free necessarily. <laughs> Just available. That's going to be our next big our challenge. Okay. So I've been pushing all of you on social benefits and you know what you can do for society. But let me turn that entirely around, which is today many companies um, uh, trumpet the fact that they're benefiting society because the consumers like it, their investors like it. There's a real tailwind to that. Do you see that? I mean, do your, are your consumers looking for that angle? Or at the end of the day, it's just about the technology and the price. You know, just I love your product. It doesn't, I don't really 
the consumers don't ever think about it. So, so we talk about that a lot. We, 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 we think that's really important. Is it actually all that important? And also on the investor side, too. At the risk of being provocative, again, you know, I, I, there's an undertone and I, of like apologizing for trying to build something that's scalable and self-funding, right? I mean, we're not trying to be a part of, a, of an ecosystem that is about raising money and then trying to convince people we have this evil version and this good version, um, <laughs> right? I mean, and I think all three of us were kind of just trying to make the, the actual thing that happens to make money and happens to be successful and happens to serve certain sets of people, but to be okay. The, the trumpeting sometimes comes from like apologizing for some of that, right? And I'm not going to necessarily be in that camp, but um, we don't need, feel the need to trumpet. However, there's definitely a trend, I think, mm -hmm. socially right now to be sorry to be capitalist when the actual actions of the same folks that are villainizing it are very capitalist. Um, so again, at the risk of being provocative, uh, you know, that I don't want to be, I just want to build a product that's, that's cool and accessible and, and equitable, but still successful, right? Yeah. I don't think it's provocative. I mean, <laughs> re recent, recent surveys suggest that millennials, which I think is much of your audience, the majority prefer the term socialism to capitalism, yeah. um, which I find quite interesting, actually. Um, what do you think on that? That's yeah, I think, I think for us, you know, the, the, I don't think we often see a ton of return uh, that's very direct. Um, from uh, sort of trumpeting or, or, or sort of uh, putting out there a social good message um, when it comes to uh, the services we offer. But I, I think there, there's something to it when it comes to sort of uh, defining our brand and, and how we go to market and, and what we mean as a company. And I think, um, I think that's a much more subtle thing and something that you build sort of over time and you really have to sort of work to earn. Um, but I think it's, um, I think if, if, you can, if you can credibly say what we're building is something um, that we think has a positive impact on cities, has a positive impact on, on economic mobility, um, I think you can, you can ultimately um, build that into a brand that is credible and that has trust with consumers. Um, and I think that matters. And I think if you look at sort of certainly the, the sort of the pure ride sharing space and the, and the amount of trust that people feel with different brands, I think um, there's definitely differentiation out there. And we, we, we work hard to make sure that, um, that, that people sort of feel that in our brand. Um, I also think it matters a lot um, for for our, sort of our employees, and I, I think for in building a team, I think um, it, it's a big it's a big factor. I think a lot. I think most people that come to Via feel like um, they're signing on because they're excited about the work, they're excited about um, what they're going to do, they're excited about building technology, um, but but they're also excited because they feel like they're they're going to be a part of something that's going to uh, sort of impact the world in a way that they're they're proud of. And I think um, that's been I think is true quite consistent. So it helps motivate employees uh, get, get you the best employees. What do you think, Nikki? I mean, you're probably of the three companies you've been one that's most closely defined as a social enterprise. What, I, what I'm actually not sure I have anything to add. I mean, I agree. Like people people want meaning in their work. Like people want to know that what they're doing is something that they support and feel good about. I think consumers want to know that you're like that we're not ice and going to collect their data and like do something problematic with it, like that's something we have to deal with. Um, and then ultimately, you know, like, like you were saying, I think um, our partners, our investors and so forth, they want to know that this is like part of a real business that they're building. I don't think anyone is excited about like, you do this stuff on the side and, and your core business is completely different. They, they want to know that um, you are growing a business and the way for us to grow a business is to serve as many people as possible. So it's the two happen to align. Um, I, so I don't know. I, I like what you all said. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask one last question related specifically to technology, and then we'll have plenty of time for audience questions. So please, um, please uh, think about some questions for our panelists. Um, just moving on the social, but to technology specifically. Up until pretty recently, up until a year or two ago, you know, technology was good. All technology was good. All technology companies were good. At least that was the general uh, zeitgeist. And that has clearly changed dramatically, in the, perhaps, let's say, since the 2016 election. Um, is this, are we now you know, heading the other way? Is this a, a long trend that technology is viewed as both good and bad? There's, there's a lot of downside risk to this. Or have we just had a, a, a temporary setback in terms of technology's role in society? What's changed? I think it's all about power. Um, and I think we're realizing in societies who has power, and therefore there's more scrutiny. And I don't think that, you know, sort of as you were saying earlier, I don't think there's like good or bad. I think there's just a lot of nuance between that. Mm. Interesting connection of power. Yeah. yeah, Silicon Valley used to be a pretty small place until a few years ago. Yeah. 
And I think like with the election that probably exposed um, the power of, of certain companies more so than before. Yeah, I think the I think people saw the duplicitousness maybe of what was going on. The the one face of like we're only here for the good, but then the the cover that was thrown off of all of the machinations that have to go in order to get that big, in order to be that big. Like, do we hate cable TV? No, we hate Comcast. You know, I love Comcast. They're great, but <laughs> nobody does, right? Nobody loves a cable company. But, you have to yeah, say that's that. my point. Like, they love cable, but not the cable company. And that's kind of where we are. I think it's a pendulum. And I think we'll find new um, torchbearers for the good part. And we'll find ways in AT&T. Like, they were bad and good and bad and good. And, um, <laughs> you know, they were broken up, but then not, uh, right? Because the technology changed. I think it's a pendulum. I think we'll see it go both ways. And I'm, I'm frankly... I love the idea that we get to a point where it naturally starts the ice flows break up um, because it creates opportunity and new innovation and you know that's why we're all here. So. Very good. Any last thoughts on that, Alex? Yeah, I would just say that I, I think it's a good thing that businesses are scrutinized, right? I think it's um, it's part of a healthy process of, of um, and maybe maybe uh, technology companies for a little while had been sort of immune to that, but I, I think it's overall a good thing. I, as as someone who um, is trying to make a business successful, I think it, I view it as a, sort of an opportunity, right, and, and to differentiate um, uh, companies who, who are trying to do something good and, and sort of doing things the right way, um, and, and that it's, in that sense, it's an opportunity. And I think um, if people are going to offer services and, and goods to uh, millions of people, they probably deserve to have uh, the way they do that. Sort of the response, the responsibility that comes with that. Yeah, I mean, with great technologies comes great power. With great power comes accountability. responsibility. Yeah. yeah, accountability. So let's take some audience questions. I understand we have some mics uh, out there somewhere. I can barely see them. But um, if you could send the mics back there. There's a couple of questions towards the back. And I just have one request for you. If your question could be a question, not a statement. <laughs> <laughs> Much appreciated. So that's, uh, lots of people can ask questions in the remaining time. Go down. I don't think so. Please. Start. Hi. Um, my question is around data. So each of you has quite a bit of really critical consumer data from where they're traveling to and from on a daily basis to very personal biometric information and credit information. How do you guys think about sharing that data with the government or with other companies and sort of like what are the foundational things you think through when thinking about sharing that data? So like there's a lot of good that can come out of sharing with the city of New York what routes people are taking and what the busiest like transit ways are and how to improve that or the most used bridges and that kind of thing. But how do you think about when is the right time to share? Should you share it? And are these governments asking you guys to give them that data? And what do you do when that happens? It's a terrific question. Who wants to tackle? Yeah, happy to, happy to tackle it first. Um, I, I think it's a really tricky thing for us. I, I think we, um, and we, we spend a lot of time on it. Um, and I think um, th there, there are definitely within the world of transportation, um, uh, I, there's there's a definitely an increasing trend of, of local governments um, seeking to get more transparency into how um, how we're doing business and our competitors are, are doing business in their cities and um, I think we, we on the one hand I, we view it as part of our responsibility uh, given we benefit a lot from um, what the public sector sort of is supporting and providing and, and we benefit from a lot of public infrastructure we, we view it as part of our responsibility to be uh, to collaborate with cities um, to provide them information which can help them uh, improve Proven a lot of ways, and in a lot of our our partnerships with with um, with public transit agencies, that's actually a critical part of, of uh, the discussion and the negotiation with them when they're going to use our, our technology. Is is what access to data will they get? But on the other hand, we, we view it as a, a really really important part um, of what we do to make sure that. Um, that we protect user privacy, in our case, driver privacy, um, when we're doing that. Um, and and we've, um, we've really gone to battle in, in, a, in a bunch of cases to make sure that that, um, that personally identifiable information um, is not shared um, in the wrong way, in a way that we view um, is sort of not appropriate. And we also do the same to protect our own IP. Um, and so I think that's something else that, that is an issue that comes up, is, is how, can, how do we work with, um, with uh, governments to make sure that our IP is protected? Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, sorry, are we all? No, please, go ahead. Sorry. I mean, yeah, the, just because of, we mentioned have biometrics and everything, uh, we, we just don't. I mean, we, <laughs> no, I, it's we, like our, our privacy policy is plain English on our website. Our um, opt-in is opt-in. Um, our opt-in is not this weird daisy chain, like, oh, now this, it's direct, it's plain English. And for the most part, we just don't. In fact, the whole point is sharing less information. Um, so our biometrics are 
entrusted, uh, the biometrics are entrusted to us. We are regulated at FISMA high, if you're familiar with that, it's FedRAMP uh, related to federal regulations, mission critical type like passport level, uh, sort of loss of life level um, audits uh, through federal regulation. But we don't share that information and that's part of the trust that our, our customers and we have. Um, for Nova, we're, we're powered by consumer consent. Like the only way that we can move data across borders is by an individual saying, like, I want my data to move from company A to company B. Um, and so we, we take that consumer consent pretty seriously. So we always give consumers copies of their data. We actually work with them to address anything they think is inaccurate, um, if they want to dispute it. In the early days, that used to actually be my phone number, um, would be <laughs> consumer disputes, which made for really fun trips to the supermarket. Still your phone number? <laughs> um, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not that far off. Um, no, I'm joking. But um, yeah, so we, we, you know, we, we take that component really, really seriously. Um, the, the, the second part is, you know, I think there's a lot of companies right now in the financial space which, which are using consumer consent um, in different ways. Uh, we've gone for the uh, hyper-regulated model. So we are regulated as a credit reporting agency in the US, pretty much the same reporting framework as like the Experians or TransUnions or Equifaxes of this world are. So it, it puts a significant onus on us, which, which we've take very seriously um, and then you know like like all of your like you know the the security um, components are extremely important so how we encrypt and store our data and I think that's only solved by like amazing technology investing in it um, and like hiring people who are real experts at that um, and I am not but I can talk a little bit about like some of the field level encryption and, and all of those components that, that we're constantly looking at as well as like pretty fun tabletop exercises that we have to do to maintain our security programs which are like one of you has been kidnapped do you give away the secret key um, so yeah I know, I know the answer yeah. <laughs> I was say, what's, what's the answer to that question? Yeah. That's what I want to know. Don't get kidding. Right. Next question. Next question. Uh, hi. Even Bruce asked about question. It's actually, I would like to share an idea. Nikki, when you told us about your problem when you just came, I remember that 25 years ago, I had the same. Mm. So, and the, what the idea is, actually, the next problem, which usually people face evaluation of diploma, high school diploma, university diploma. Maybe it's not in the stream of your main business, but you can provide this service as well. That is a brilliant idea, and I wish we could do it, but there's actually an amazing NGO called World, Ed World Education Services, yeah. which provides this. Um, and they, pro I think even <coughs> Columbia, they work Yeah, with they work with pretty much all universities, I believe. Um, but we've been looking at a number of partnerships with them, and I, I think that team is terrific. But thank you for, for the idea, and I'd like some more afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of on the same theme as that first question, but more of a top-down approach for it. So if you think of the governments who are really at the leading edge of creating digital identities, and you know, especially Eastern European countries even, who that data, even from the moment you're born, is stored and you can access it for different services, what can government be doing for you to kind of ease the process of both collecting and securing that data? Um, it really depends on some of the uh, how you approach it philosophically. The top down is very interesting. And, and there's gonna be some sort of cultural uh, embellishment into what works and where it works. In the United States, it's, it's a little bit different in that they kind of don't want that top down approach. They want the access and the scale, um, but there's a lot of resistance to having that, uh, like, okay, you're born, you're in this database, now how can I use it? Um, if you actually look, the government's actually much more restricted than what you can opt into commercially. So a lot of our partnership is about allow allowing that sort of to flow back and forth. There's this commercial version of you, which you approved with us, and then there's a government version of you, which can get screened and has a background check with the FBI. That's like pre-check versus clear. Um, as far as feeding information in, fidelity of proofing, that binding agent between the human when we collect the biometrics versus who they are, um, Obviously, that could be very greatly improved if the person opts into us accessing that particular row in the table in the government database. Um, but simply importing all of those and being an arbiter is not, I think it fundamentally changes our position towards our relationship with our members and our customers. So we'd probably shy away from that a little bit. However, having access to a it's like cryptocurrency versus fiat currency, and I hate to bring that up, but Ooh, that's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah, but you actually sure want to go down there, rabbit you, hole. You, you can demonstrate ownership through the possession of a very 
like specific and high fidelity key versus I swear to God I'm the person with this hundred thousand dollar balance and here's how I prove it right so that fidelity if we can bring the fidelity into the government identity space it's about that connection but I don't necessarily want access like whole whole hog access to these databases necessarily it's interesting yeah, in the US top down is not yeah. politically palatable I would say yeah and and you some places yes but not not here not in this no. country yeah next question we have a mic on this side as well, just so people on this side can. Then we'll go back to that side. Hi there. Can you talk about your approach to innovation? Your businesses are all very innovative and new, but you know you have to constantly level up. Can you talk about how you solve for those problems? The CEO yells at you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. She's great. <laughs> Time tested. <technique. laughs> what do you think? Innovation? Who wants to? Yeah, sure. So I, I think for us. Um, some of it comes from our customers, right? So some of it comes from um, you. We start to introduce solutions to our customers, and, and we um, and, and we start to hear from them about things that they want. Um, this happens to us probably more on the the sort of B two B working with government side of the business, where we hear a lot from customers about how we can be better and, and how we can uh, we can sort of improve services. Um, I, I think a lot of it also comes. Uh, at some point, someone told me that. Um, Anyone who's more than sort of like uh, two layers um, from from sort of like the field level uh, of interacting with customers or drivers or whatever it is um, usually isn't going to have a specific enough good new idea uh, to um, really sort of make it worth it. Um, and so we, we we try to sort of ha have a culture of experimentation um, and sort of or organic um, uh, openness to new ideas uh, from from sort of everyone at our at the company. And and I think um, that translates ultimately to some processes by which we take those ideas and turn them into things and. and and sort of vet them and figure out which ones we want to act on. Um, but we try to have a sort of a culture that really just encourages um, people to be able to come up with new ideas and act on them. Um, and then as, as they show promise, um, be able to sort of invest in them, put, put more capital and resources behind them um, to sort of help them grow. Any thoughts, Nikki? Innovation uh, we're still, we're very, I think we're, we're earlier than my esteemed fellow panelists. And so we still have a lot to deliver on our like starting innovation. And so I think what we've learned a lot in the last year has been the power of focus, actually. Um, and so actually trying to do less, uh, which maybe isn't as exciting as, as it should no, be. No, it stays <laughs> important all throughout. Yeah. Hi, um, I have a question for Alex. Uh, I was wondering how you think of the competition with Uber and Lyft, um, especially they're going public pretty soon and receive more capitals going forward. Yeah, that's a good question. One, one we get a lot. I will you say. ever heard that? Uh, <laughs> um, so I think um, we we really think actually of our competition of, of all forms of transportation, right? And so as we um, we want to provide ultimately sort of dynamic mass transit systems, and so um, we view in a lot of ways, um, and it depends a little bit on the market and the situation and the user. Um, uh, the the private car um, and, and an Uber or a Lyft, and in some cases even uh, public transit, um, as as much of an alternative for our customers um, uh, as anything, and so. Um, as we think of all of those options, I think um, w the thing we, we think most about is um, how do we provide sort of a unique value proposition to the user, right? And so one thing we focused a lot on is, is cost, right? How, how can we ultimately, um, through technology, through operational expertise, through, um, through focus, as Nikki said, how can we um, ultimately do as much as we can to bring the cost of the ride down? Because um, we think that usually enables sort of a sustainable advantage. Um, but I think you're totally right around the, the capital question is, in, in our case, um, both, both some of our uh, competitors uh, in the ride-sharing space and also obviously um, in a lot of cases sort of public governments who are, who are building services um, ha have a lot of funds and so we need to think and have focus about where we invest um, which cities we launch in um, how much investment uh, realistically uh, uh, launching a new market might take um, and so we, we do we think a lot about that and I think um, have to be sort of quite quite diligent in how we sort of allocate our, our capital to to invest in different places time for two or three more questions yeah Hi, uh, my question is around uh, the appetite, the trust, uh, the appetite for the trust of the consumers. Today we are talking about all these bizarre experiments with the technology, but let's just rewind 10 years back when we would have thought like, you know, sharing biometric information or sharing my credit information would be, you know, kind of problematic for me. <laughs> but now, like when we are talking about all these innovation, have you think over time customers' appetite for innovation has increased? And also how we have ingrained our product to build that trust factor in it? Um, I, I think uh, appetite for innovation, it's more about appetite for fixing uh, existing problems, right? 
Um, you know, I, I think innovation for innovation's sake, you know, a smaller phone or a bigger phone or however it ended up going isn't necessarily, but uh, there, there's an appetite for sort of min-maxing the very best of the balance. So would it be great for you to be the only one that ever sees your face and ever um, knows anything about you? Interesting, but you can't operate like that. So how do I share that information in the most responsible way and how do I make sure the people that I'm sharing it with, be it clear or, or how you're allowing somebody to access that information from clear, um, is about looking at the alternative. Should I be handing all my documents to everybody every time I go into a, a bank? Ideally not. Um, so the, the future, I think, of innovation in the social space is about looking at, look at autonomous driving, because that's maybe you a little bit, but that's not necessarily <laughs> any of us. But it would be amazing if we could improve what is right now a, a, a bad system, which has been improving so much, right? I mean, compared to what we used to do, it's about continuing to improve. So finding those, those places for innovation, ideally, that's where the intelligent innovation goes, um, rather than just for the sake of... Um, for the sake of a new toy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I would say uh, the only thing I would add is that I think um, I think you you have to in order to in, to gain someone's trust and and um, and have them give something to you, you have to provide something I think really valuable in return. And so mm. um, I think in order for that trade off to work, uh, I think this the the service or the good that's being provided to someone um, in exchange for, for um, providing uh, a company with their information um, has to be a, of a lot of value. And for that to continue progressing, I think that the value needs to keep being sort of delivered more and more. And so in, in a world of autonomous vehicles, for example, I think um, it, maybe maybe there you need to a face ID uh, recognition in order to authenticate that you're the one getting into the vehicle, right? Um, are you okay giving that up? Well, if the service is, is good enough and it's it's uh, convenient enough for you and it's cheap for you and all that, uh, then maybe you'll be willing to give that up, but um, in other use cases, maybe not. Like I, I'm, I'm probably not willing to do Face ID um, on certain apps on my phone, but on my banking app, which is a lot of, a lot of value for me, I'm, I'm willing to do it. Being so like connected or somewhere in the middle between like the public and private sector, legislation can change at any time like it did with ride sharing apps in New York City last year. So how do you, your companies prepare yourselves with like eyes and ears on the ground with any legislation either across the globe or in the US? Like how do you prepare for that? Um, I'm not gonna answer this question because we have the opposite problem. Um, <laughs> so credit reporting regulation last changed 40 years ago. Um, there's been discussion around changing it for decades. Um, and so most of the like innovations right now are operating in, in a little bit of a gray zone. Um, there's some talk around changing that around bank transaction data. Um, we work very closely with regulators and so forth, but ultimately we're, we're not facing an ever-changing regulatory environment. And I think that in itself is, is, is problematic as well. Yeah, we stay connected. We, we have um, a lot of contact with anything from DC to our uh, airport individual airport relationships, local TSA, DHS, CBP. Um, so we stay as connected as possible and, and just try to stay, you know, make sure that facts and reason come into the discussion rather than knee jerk. And really our, our, our ask is scalpel rather than sledgehammer. And that's kind of where we're all really living is let's not overreact and let's not ruin everything. For, uh, let's, let's solve the problem at hand. So that, that's typically the approach that we take. Yeah, I mean, to, to answer the question, I think from our perspective, agree in that we, we try to we try to have as proactive a relationship, um, whether it's in a market where we're being regulated, we're providing consumer services, uh, or one in which we're partnering with the government. I think we we try to have as proactive a relationship as possible. So uh, be talking to um, the regulator both in uh, good times and times when they're trying to introduce uh, new legislation. Um, and I think the the oftentimes I, I like the scalpel sort of analogy. I think. Um, Many of, of public regulators are, are quite open to hearing feedback on, on how um, uh, sort of new regulations that they're introducing um, are going to affect um, your business. Um, some, some are less so, or some uh, hear it and, and decide to do otherwise. Um, but I think we've been able to often um, be a participant in the dialogue um, uh, leading up to new regulations, um, and that's been very helpful. And I think um, we, we've generally worked with regulators who are, who are willing to listen. Um, I think there are exceptions, and uh, not to... to um, 
to sort of knock anyone, but I, I think the, the exceptions usually happen when there are a lot of politics involved, I think. Um, and so when, when um, there's a political issue or a very public issue, I think um, to, from what I've seen, that's usually the case when um, more unreasonable or less uh, thought through sort of proposals um, make it all the way through the, the legislative process. Um, thankfully, we're lucky to live in a country where I think most of the time um, there's a pretty robust process, um, policy process in, in most, um, in our case, local um, sort of markets um, where th there's time for the public and for companies and for um, for customers to sort of input uh, before a new regulation is handed down. I'll add one more quick sure. thing. I mean, I think it's an interesting opportunity to really understand the reality of this, which is there is sort of money in politics and influence involved, which means that voting with your wallet, being uh, so sort of working with companies that you know are, are channeling their capital through those systems, which exist for better or for worse, and let's change it if we can, but they exist for better or for worse, vote for the company, vote with your wallet for the companies that are channeling that through the people and the actions and the policies that you want to see enacted. Um, because not only does your vote count, but how you spend the money on the people that are influencing other people who vote count as well. So vote, vote, vote with your wallet, not a bad yeah. way to end the yeah. panel. I'm aware that um, one this more panel question. stands between you and lunch. So Stella, one more question? One more question. We have five minutes after. to lunch, and that's a dangerous place to be for a panel. But we'll take one more question. Um, Thank you all for letting me be the last question and for being here. I was curious in talking about how these social images becoming really important for our business models. Have any of you had an example where you're looking at a business strategy and it looks really like it's going to be really profitable and good, but decided against it or had to change it because you were worried about investor, employee, or customers not liking the social implications? Um, yeah. Um, I think at the end of the day, like you have to build and work at a business you're proud of and do things you're proud of. And there are things that you might choose not to do. I mean, for us, the, um, there are, you know, I think credit reports get used for a lot of uses. Some of them make sense and some of them are actually problematic, like not necessarily, you know, correlating credit score to like employment performance is um, something that gets done in the industry. It's not very clear that it actually is predictive, but it is very clear that it ends up being discriminatory. Um, and so we just haven't touched that. Um, and, and I'm sure like there are nuances and there's probably ways that we could do it. Like I don't, I generally don't think the world is black and white, but um, I think, you know, all of us as individuals, you know, you see Enron, you see Theranos, like I think um, everyone at a business school has a responsibility to think about like, am I operating in a way that passes my own litmus test? Yeah, either every week or every day, for sure. Um, you know, especially in biometrics and, you know, we're, we're not a surveillance company, that's the point, but biometrics are used for surveillance. Uh, and so we fight against that and we make sure we stay far away from any use cases that could be confused with that. Mm. Yeah, I would agree as well. I, I think sort of constantly, and I think um, a lot of it has to do with, uh, before I was saying about sort of your, the brand and the, the sort of what we want to put out there in terms of what we stand for as a company. Um, and I think often it's about emphasis, right? There aren't that many decisions that are totally black and white, um, but where you end up spending your time and, and what products you end up developing and, and what the, how those reflect um, what you do. Um, a concrete example for us is um, we're really focused on providing pooled shared ride um, transit solutions. Um, and um, we, we know that some people want to travel, travel uh, sort of in private rides. And so we eventually, after uh, lots of internal debate and discussion, uh, decided we would add a private ride product at some point um, you know, as a complement uh, to um, our shared ride solutions in the consumer service because we knew that was a it's a big market opportunity customers were asking for it um, but it was a big debate and I think um, when we now look at how we spend our time our, our overwhelmingly our product development our um, algorithm development our, our sort of future technology thinking is all around the shared ride product and yes we have a private ride product and we want it to work and we want it to be good but um, when you think about where we spend our time we allocate most of it to the thing we're um, we're really focused on being good at and that we think is really the thing that's going to move us forward and, and um, hopefully move cities forward maybe just one more thought is I, I think it goes beyond your like product and business model I think it's just like the how you operate like you're constantly faced with choices. Like this person didn't negotiate their salary. This person did. How do we navigate that? Or like um, this channel partner of us said something really sexist to one of our employees. Like how do we navigate that? They're also our important channel partners. So like I think um, you know part of what I am so grateful to my MBA for is like having a community of, of peers to talk to about some of these dynamics and, and having learned some approaches in school. But um, you are going to face this every day, all the time. There's no shying away from it. And I think categorizing the world into like, these are the good things and these are the bad things and we just don't touch this, like actually is, is 
you, you are kidding yourself. You're not um, forcing yourself to contemplate the areas where you're going to come across it. So very insightful comments, really on company culture, which yeah. matters. Mm -hmm. um, terrific. Please join me in thanking our panelists today.